Today I'm visiting the market town of Glastonbury in the heart of Somerset, famous for its uh, great medieval abbey and the tour that towers above it. I'll explain both to you shortly. Walking out of town, we walk uh, slightly to the southwest of town. There's a, there's a rise all the way up through the market town of Glastonbury, but um, eventually you get to the outskirts and uh, open fields. This is common throughout England. Uh, I tell my tour members this all the time as we're driving around the countryside. Um, you go into a village and very quickly, um, uh, without any urban sprawl whatsoever, you're out into the mar out into the countryside. Here I am now. We're walking up through um, uh, some fields. You see sheep on either side. Walking through fields. This can be quite alien to some people, but uh, I am exercising my right to roam. Here in Britain, we have a, a, a wonderful tradition. It dates right back into our uh, uh, early prehistory, uh, the ability, the right to roam or walk between villages, communities. Uh, it's an inherent right. Um, it's not complete. The, there are some restrictions nowadays. Uh, walls have been built, hedgerows have, been, ha, have grown. However, there are well delineated footpaths, about 130,000 miles of them. Uh, all over the British Isles and enabled us to walk through people's properties. As long as we don't molest the sheep, as long as we don't upset animals in the farms, um, uh, we are allowed to exercise this right. And that's what I'm doing now. Um, I'm heading up towards uh, uh, a tor, T-O-R. This is a hill, it's a sandstone hill that towers over the market town of Glastonbury, famous really for its abbey. But the tor itself is quite a strange feature. Uh, this area is called the Somerset Levels, and uh, the ground is actually very flat around us, um, except for this one hill that I'm walking up. Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph of Arimathea. I believe he was uh, uh, Jesus Christ's uncle, um, uh, perhaps. And he is reputed to have been looking for tin in this area. There was a storm that ravaged him, ravaged his boats. He had to bring the boat into safe harbour and he headed for the one high promontory in the area and that was this tor. At that point in time, the tor was an island. It was surrounded by the sea. They found shelter on this little island. He planted his staff in the ground and he went off in search of water. The staff took root while he was gone and grew into a beautiful thorn tree, a little hawthorn tree. He found some fresh water. He put his chalice underneath the spring that was pouring the water out of the side of this hill. And uh, as it did so, the water turned red. Now this lays foundation to uh, uh, some wonderful traditions that Jesus Christ uncle founded the first Christian settlement here in England. If that's the case, that happened in around 63 AD. There are all sorts of problems with that story, uh, particularly the dates, um, but uh, we'll let that ride for the moment. We're going to carry on walking through this lovely field. Oh, look, I see in front of me a... Oh, yes, it is. It's a kissing gate. Here we are. Some of you have traveled with me. We've had great fun at kissing gates, but you can see it's a wonderful mechanism. Um, it prevents sheep from walking through, but it allows people like us, exercising our right to roam, to wander through these pastures and uh, exit and enter quite safely. However, there is a tradition here too. At the Kissing Gate, you'll see it briefly in a moment, you have to kiss the person you're with in order to, uh, uh, to gain passage. Here it is coming up, lovely little Kissing Gate, great example actually. Well maintained. These pathways are always well maintained um, and well trodden, I might add. The, uh, the Brits, they love to walk. We're going to ascend through this gate and go on up to the tour. And here we are, we're on top of the tour now. Um, you can see there's a church steeple on top. So here we are on top of Glastonbury Tour. You can see a number of people um, are congregating, enjoying the, the weather. It's dry at least. It was rainy a little bit coming up. Um, they're all practicing social distancing and obviously family units. So, uh, so we're, we're okay today, which is really nice in these troubled times. 
The tower, what is the tower? The tower is uh, the remains of a church. Um, in 1275, the original wooden church, a Saxon church, was destroyed in the Great Earthquake. The same earthquake, that actually, that destroyed St. Michael's uh, 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 Chapel on St. Michael's Mount, near Penzance in Cornwall. Many buildings were destroyed during that great earthquake, and many of them were called St. Michael's, which is very interesting to me, um, because, uh, of course, St. Michael is a saint who was brought in, essentially, to chase away pagan deities, uh, pagan demons. And, uh, of course, the church itself, named after St. Michael, was destroyed by Mother Nature. A little sense of irony there, I suspect. Um, here we are, we're looking around the surrounding countryside. As I said, we're on top of a high peak. We're looking out over the Somerset levels. The area you see beneath you was once a sea, a salt marsh, essentially. T very tidal, but a salt marsh. Uh, there would have been small settlements down there, but very few of them. Uh, we have found trace of them going back to the Bronze Age, so about 4,000 years of uninterrupted history in this area. So this area is steeped in history, of course, the abbey just beneath us, um, here the tour stands. Uh, many churches are sat on this spot, uh, this is just the remains of one of them. Um, but um, incredibly, the tour itself has a lot of history itself. We, we, we believe that it's actually a, the site of a Bronze Age community, a Bronze Age settlement. There are terraces around the tour, you can't see them from, from the elevation that we're at on top of the tour. But all the way around the tour, there are concentric bands that were once upon a time uh, great ditches, uh, defensive ditches, and banks, of course, therefore, inside them. A uh, network of them that uh, encapsulated the tour itself and a shallow ridge that goes off to the southeast of the tour. Um, it's a quite a large community, uh, dating back to at least the Iron Age. Uh, the Iron Age in Britain begins around 800 BC and finished essentially at the time the Romans arrived. Um, there's some arguments over that, but anyway, we'll, we'll say from 800 BC to uh, the beginning of the uh, first century AD. People were living here uh, in a community, in a village situation. And uh, there was probably, we believe, probably a standing stone or some form of uh, stone icon here at the top of the mount, uh, top of the tour, which was removed when Christianity came to town. So in the fourth, fifth, sixth century, when Christianity was beginning to, 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 to flex its muscle, um, the, tone would, the stone would have been taken away and uh, a church or chapel probably in the early days was erected here on its place. Um, now, around us, uh, uh, as you look around on the video, you'll see that the landscape is beautiful. It was this, uh, I've already said, it was marshland, it was a, a tidal marsh, um, so essentially part of the sea. Um, and there were communities out there dating back into the Bronze Age. Now, they had walkways that were created uh, using timber um, and reeds. They used the materials around them to build the villages. They would have been floating on the marshes. Think of the things you've seen in National Geographic, up on Lake Titicaca, these floating villages. That's exactly what was here 4,000 years ago. There were communities such as that living here on the marshes beneath us. Um, they would have seen the tour and thought it's quite a sacred place, so they probably revered it in some way as well. Um, we, find, we have found signs of those communities, archaeological excavations have taken place there. So it's a fascinating area to come and visit. Actually in the village of Glastonbury there is a small museum, a very small local museum, that um, uh, uh, gives a lot of background information to those very early communities and settlements here. Um, a little bit further on into history, after the Romans, um, we slip into the Dark Ages. The Romans left in the 5th century AD, and uh, it, it was the beginning of our Dark Ages, essentially. Administration had gone, infrastructure had gone. Uh, other peoples, other groups of peoples, communities from Northern Europe were coming to settle here in the British Isles. Lovely farmland, it was the, the breadbasket of Europe at that point in time. That's why the Romans settled here, that's why they came. Um, but uh, these groups of people, the Angles, the Saxons, the Jutes, they of course lend their name to the English. Um, uh, I am English, courtesy of the Angles and the Saxons and the Jutes. These groups of people came from Northern Europe and they settled in the farmlands of lowland British Isles, the areas that we now call England. The people that were here before were displaced, some of them at least, were disenfranchised and displaced. And they went up into the highland areas of the British Isles, into what we now call the Highlands of Scotland, the Highlands of Wales. Um, where there were people already, but these people were unaffected 
by Roman occupation and subsequently by the Angles and the Saxons and subsequently by the Normans when they came in 1066. <coughs> People came for the farmland. They didn't come for those highland areas. Um, where, where uh, uh, disenfranchised people lived and where there could be a, a, a little bit of a, a hornet's nest of trouble waiting for them. So they settled in the lowland areas, the, the, uh, uh, the wonderful grasslands, uh, farmlands of, of, of England itself. Um, so here at Glastonbury, what happened? Well, here in the Dark Ages, um, we had Danish incursions, Danish Vikings pushed down uh, to the Bath area. Those of you who've been to Bath know that the River Avon runs through it. Um, and then it runs out to sea, out to our west. <coughs> and um, essentially almost connects with uh, uh, the River Thames to the east of, of, of Bath. But the Danish Vikings headed south towards Bath, as it is now, it wasn't then, and they were going to cross that river and take the Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Wessex. So in the 5th, 6th century, you have Anglo-Saxon kingdoms developing into the 7th century, developing even, stro even more strongly. Um, and uh, there were a number of kingdoms in Britain. You have Northumbria, you have uh, uh, East Anglia, which is actually a, a, a Danish Viking kingdom. You have uh, Mercia uh, Saxon, Wessex Saxon. And the Danish Vikings decided they wanted Wessex. So they came across the River Avon and swarmed into this part of the world. Now, a great king at the time, his name was Alfred, lost um, his, his, his kingdom essentially uh, as the result of three short, sharp battles against the Danish Vikings. He was defeated and he fled into the marshes underneath Glastonbury Tor. He could find solace, he could find safety there, and uh, he hid away from the Vikings on one of those little humps that you can see uh, underneath the Tor as we pan the camera around, called Athelney. <laughs> Still a village there today. Of course, now it's dry land and farmland around it, but it was swamp land um, and a tiny little island. And on that was a small, small community, a little fishing community, people that would fish eels out of the marshes. And he, he stopped there, he stayed there one, one horrible winter, back in the 700s. And um, he tried to compose himself, he tried to bring, get, get himself together in his head. He wanted to figure a way to get his kingdom back from the Vikings. Well, he slowly forged uh, some alliances with some uh, stronger alliances with some of the uh, local earls uh, in Somerset, in Devon, in Dorset. And uh, he put a call out that winter. He wanted to gather those men at arms together. And uh, in the depths of winter, they surprised the Danish Vikings and they pushed them back out of Wessex. Alfred, because of this uh, and because of what he subsequently did, he built, built barrier towns all the way along the River Avon and uh, across the River Kennet towards London and up into the, the marches of Wales. Uh, built towns um, that were defended, that had their own garrisons, albeit with militias, uh, which made it difficult for the Vikings to gain any more adhesion. The Vikings whom he had defeated actually bent their knee to him, and he being a Christian, probably worshipped here at one point in time on the Glastonbury Tor. Uh, uh, they bent their knee to him and they claimed Christianity as their own, revoking pagan uh, worship in the process. Um, and as a result of that, there was peace. There was a great period of peace, um, thanks to King Alfred and his victories against the Vikings. Um, and these fortified towns that he built uh, were a big part of that. Now, when you travel through Britain, if you see a town that finishes in Burg or Bury or Borough, um, those are all words that are telling you that they have something to do with the Saxon kingdoms, um, quite possibly were built by King Alfred himself as a defensive town or a defensive mechanism against the Vikings. Um, So as I pan the camera around once more, you can see St. Michael's Tower, you can see the uh, last glimpse of the countryside behind, and you can see the English enjoying themselves. Uh, <laughs> you 
come rain or shine, they're out enjoying themselves. We have so many of these wonderful sights in Britain. Uh, we're going to head back down the tour now and go into the town of uh, Glastonbury, and I'm going to show you the Abbey. Um, the Abbey is the most amazing place. Uh, I want you to understand when you see it in a few minutes um, that uh, this Abbey was home at its height to about 1,100 monks, clerics, priests, um, uh, and was a, an extremely powerful place. Um, the church here has very little actually to do with the, the abbey beneath us and uh, we shall go on down, have a look at the abbey, have a little tour of the abbey. Uh, but first of all, this little message. If you're enjoying this uh, video, I'm going straight back to the video now, um, please uh, uh, please donate, please contribute. I always ask for that. Um, I don't charge for these videos. I don't have a, pay, uh, a page for you to enter to come in and see them. Um, I hope you do enjoy it. If you do, please go to the PayPal link that you'll see underneath the video here on YouTube and they contribute whatever it is you wish um, and it will be gratefully accepted. Thank you very much indeed. Um, the next video we'll be doing will be of the great city of Wells. Um, that's coming up shortly. Um, so, uh, so I look forward to your contributions and thank you very much for watching. One last thing to add uh, as we head down is this uh, tour was the site of a terrible, terrible deed. Um, the great King Henry VIII himself is responsible. Uh, his friend at the time was the powerful abbot of uh, Glastonbury Abbey and uh, the abbot refused to hand over the papers to the abbey at the time of the dissolution of the monasteries and abbeys here in England. So Henry actually had his, uh, uh, his men-at-arms take the, the cleric up to the top of this tour and had him and two other priests executed. They were hung, drawn and quartered on this spot as a warning to all other clerics who might resist him in his attempts at uh, destroying abbey and monastic life here in the British Isles. Um, as we know, uh, it was successful. Uh, abbey life came to an end. And uh, at the time of the dissolution, Henry uh, put out of business essentially 800 abbeys and monasteries across the f length and breadth of the British Isles. They were shut down. They were, they were closed. And in a little while, I'll explain to you what that was all, all about. It's a, it's a great chapter in British history, and Glastonbury Tour represents that in, in quite a meaningful way. Now let's go on down to the village and down to uh, the market town of Glastonbury and explore the abbey. Off we go. So I'm going to follow uh, uh, this main road down into Glastonbury itself. Um, note the uh, stone walls on the left uh, and you'll see the brick tiled roofs and also a lot of brick buildings here in Glastonbury. This is a marshy area, therefore clay today is the dominant building material, but we're also in the shadow of the Mendip Hills, the sort of the tail end of the Cotswolds, and uh, limestone is prevalent there. So we have limestone walls and we have brick walls and brick roofs. You can also notice um, at this moment in time on a raised road, again, if it's a clay flat area, you need to raise yourself up out of the mud. So we, we do have raised streets in some of the smaller towns in this area. There's a lovely example here now. Uh, but we're going to follow this road now down into uh, the market square of Glastonbury. So here we are now in the uh, main high street of uh, Glastonbury. In Britain, we don't use the word main street very much. Um, we generally use the word high street as a name, certainly, but also as to indicate that it's the main 
retail thoroughfare in town and this is it now i'm standing actually in the market square you can't see a square now but you will see an open space around me as i pan the camera around in a moment it's very much a one street town and looking up the hill there uh, there's a the very old church, St. Edward's, off to the left-hand side, a church that was originally built by the, the abbot of the abbey. Now, we're going to walk across the road in a moment and go into the abbey itself. But bear in mind, abbeys were monastic. They had large walls all the way around them. And to cater to the parishioners uh, 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 around the abbey and the people who worked their land, they would build a parish church. And the parish church is just up that road off to the left. We're not gonna explore that, we're going to the abbey, but as I pan the camera around, you can see it's a one street town, beautiful little town. It's very artsy, very, uh, uh, what's the word? Very indie, uh, flower power. Um, it, it's it's quite, a, quite a unique sort of place. If you're into spiritualism or strange religions, this is the place to be. It's all happening here in town. Everything from Wiccanism to to uh, uh, some of the, the more mainstream religions and, and religious practices. Look at this wonderful structure here on the right hand side. This is a fountain, not a fountain in, in, in the normal sense of the word. This would provide water to your horse or horses if you were to come into the market to trade on market day. Of course, that practice doesn't happen anymore. Um, we don't bring horses into town to sell them or ride them into town for our shopping purposes. Uh, but the fountain is there nonetheless as a sign of prestige and wealth and uh, you can actually help yourself to a little drink of water if you want to from that fountain. Um, on market days, uh, there are set market days here in town. They, there are, they are numerous. Most days of the week that I've been here, there is some small market right here in the market square. Not selling animals as it would have been once upon a time, or produce as it once have, would once have been. Nowadays, it's more knickknacks, books, music, tie-dye t-shirts, that sort of thing. So we're going to cross over now into the Abbey. So as we enter the Abbey, we come through the admissions area and on the other side of the, the admissions area and the small museum they have there, there's this little chapel. Uh, the Abbey is still a place of worship and pilgrims do still come from all over the world to uh, pay homage here at a Christian site to St Andrews here at Glastonbury Abbey. The Abbey itself was founded by a man called King Ina um, in the 700s, um, a Saxon king. Uh, who had turned to Christianity. He was responsible for founding the first stone-built church here. There may have been a wooden structure here before, uh, as on uh, Glastonbury Tor, uh, but we're not sure. We don't know that for sure, but uh, he certainly founded the first stone-built church here in the 700s. He also founded, at the same time, Wells Cathedral. I'm going to do a virtual tour there in a week or so. And he also founded, uh, founded Bath Abbey, all at about the same time. So a very devout man who gave land and wealth and money to the new Christian church. Um, you can see the wall paintings here, uh, reminiscent of a, of a bygone era when churches, the interior churches in Britain, were heavily decorated, heavily decorated, very similar to the sort of thing you would see still in the, in the Middle East and the Balkans. Uh, these church wall surfaces would have been highly decorated, not what you see in most churches in Britain today. I'll come back to that later. We're going through a wall. Just look at the high wall to the left. I'll come back to that as well in a moment. But uh, we're actually entering the abbey grounds themselves. So here we are, you can see the lavender on the left, you see the high wall to the left, and straight ahead of us is a marquee. There are very often special events going on here. In fact, I was here with the tour group some years ago, and Prince Charles was here in attendance. He came and joined our picnic. Some of you listening may remember that. Um, here we have a, a rather sad thorn tree, um, and uh, one right next to it, actually, you see it overhanging the, the pathway here, actually a, another thorn tree, but in full bloom. These two trees are, we call them the, uh, the religious thorns of, uh, of Glastonbury. They are reputed to be descendants of the original staff. Remember, we're up on Glastonbury tour and I mentioned Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph, uh, 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 Joseph uh, planted his staff in the tour, in the ground of the tour, and it took root. These two thorn trees are meant to be descended from his original staff. Every Christmas, a sprig of one of those thorn trees that will be flowering will be taken and placed on Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth's uh, breakfast table. 
and that has been going on for centuries. Isn't tradition wonderful? Now here we are, we're walking towards the ruin that is Glastonbury Abbey. It's a gorgeous structure, wonderful structure. And remember what I said back in the chapel, King Ina founded this, this, uh, 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 this abbey, monastic settlement, back in the 700s. So it has quite a history, quite a tradition, and we're going to start to pull, up, pull to pieces some of those threads of history and archaeology as we enter. Looking at the Lady Chapel right now, this is the more recent addition to the church, dates back to the 13th, 14th, 15th centuries. And here I am now standing on the footpath that looks down into what was once the nave. There's the Lady Chapel again, you can see straight ahead. As I pan around, you can see one of the walls of the Abbey itself. Great windows, lovely grassy area by the way. We have picnics here on some of our tours. It's a lovely spot to do that. Today it's quite quiet and quite shaded, it's lovely. Using limestone, everything here is limestone. Um, again, courtesy of the Mendips just off to the north of us here. Although the abbey is built on flat ground and built on the Somerset marshes, uh, they've used the stone uh, and the stone quarries out of the Mendip Hills themselves. Brought it down here. They would have taken great oaks from the forest up on the hills as well to create the large timber roofs and vaulted roofs that would have existed at the time uh, that the abbey was constructed. Slates also would have come down out of the hills and uh, from nearby North, uh, North Wales it would have been shipped across. Stained glass windows in abundance. The stained glass wasn't coloured, it was natural colour and the glass will have been sourced from all over Europe and brought to this site in ingots when the abbey was originally built and it would then have been heated up and uh, uh, blown essentially to be then be cut and flattened out then they could cut the pieces they needed and place them into the into the uh, uh, the window sections it's always a very peaceful place this i love glastonbury abbey and we're going to walk up into a grassy area in the middle of the abbey in just a moment So gorgeous Gothic windows, Gothic arches. Um, the, there is the remains of one arch, one central arch here um, at the end of the nave uh, that would have gone up into the sky originally about 130 or 140 feet. The, the top of the arch is gone now. You can see here these arches to either side of that great arch uh, are extremely high too. Look at the scale. See this, the height of these people. They're standing in the nave. So at one point in time, the abbey will have been home to uh, about 1,100 people at its height of power. Uh, this grassy area uh, would have been a tiled floor. Every tile would have been handmade out of the clay in the area, it would have been baked, glazed, um, coloured. You can see a great example here that uh, uh, is still accessible. The tiles are still there, they're underneath the grass. There's no point in removing the glass for you to see the tile because the tiles will then perish. Mother Nature will take a hold on them and destroy them. We know they're there, this is what they look like. Let's protect and preserve them by leaving the blanket of grass on them. Gorgeous arches, as I just said. Look at the, uh, uh, the, the, the stone masonry here. This is a wonderful achievement, a great, uh, it's a masterpiece of architecture. You all know, I'm sure, what a Gothic arch is. It's a way to create height and light, um, give strength to walls, reach up into the sky, reach up to the heavens, essentially, by creating these specific arches. Arches that were in Britain before that were rounded. They weren't familiar with the practice of um, creating great uh, uh, pointed arches to create more strength. Now here is something very interesting. This little marker shows you that it's the final resting place of a man called King Arthur. Now I'm going to stop the video one moment because I want to explain this legend and story to you. So let's discuss, discuss King Arthur. Who was he? Um, was he a man or is he just an idea, a myth? That's his resting place right here in Glastonbury Abbey. If you believe all of the tra traditions and myths, he could have been living in any one of a dozen places in Britain or in Normandy in, uh, or in Brittany in Western France. 
Interesting character. Uh, a man who we are led to believe was a good man who fought against evil, essentially, boiling it down. Where did he come from? He might have come from South Wales, he might have come from North Wales, he might have come from uh, the shadow of Hadrian's Wall, he might have come from Tintagel in Cornwall, um, a place that I take my tour members on, uh, on, on my small group tours. Uh, but this is his final resting place, or is it? Lots of questions, I love this story. Um, there were lots of oral traditions. Before uh, organized religion came to town, there were oral traditions that were moving from one community to another about this character who was important to those local people. The stories go right back. We can trace them right back into the depth of the Bronze Age. Think about the sword in the stone. What is that? We know it's a great part of the Arthurian legends, um, but what is that act? the sword in the stone. It's taking a sword out of a stone. What does a blacksmith do? A blacksmith in the Bronze Age was probably the most important man in the community. He could make metal for decorative arts, for, for bridal pieces, for swords, for farming tools. He was a very, very important man. And he was uh, able to use chemistry. He was able to forge metals out of stone. And the final act, of course, was pouring molten metal into a mold and taking the sword out of the stone. Sword in the stone. Um, Glastonbury, here where we stand right now, um, is important because there are different etymologies for the word Glastonbury. But one of them is, uh, is uh, uh, and when I say that, I mean the meaning of the, of the place name. Uh, one of those meanings is bury, is bur corruption of the word berg, so it's Saxon, it means fortified, defensive. But then glasdon, glas in uh, Old Britonic would mean water. Well, we know that the Glastonbury Tour was surrounded by water. Glas, ton, bury. Ton is done or fortified as well, so we have fortified, fortified, but area surrounded by water. Um, that goes back to the Bronze Age. Glasgow takes us back into the Bronze Age. At the same time as the myths and stories swirling around Arthur were prevalent, or a blacksmith were prevalent. Well, eventually Christianity came to town and settled in this area. We know that already. Thanks to the Romans arriving, Christianity arrived with them, um, and was settled here with them, and in this area, churches began to develop. Um, Monks in the 11th century, 12th century, Gerald of Wales, uh, William, uh, Geoffrey, Geoffrey of Monmouth, uh, they gathered together these oral traditions about uh, these important people and they put a name to those important people and they called them one person, Arthur. Arthur was a man who could take his sword and defeat evil and uh, claim large tracts of land, large tracts of the regions of Britain for the Christian church. So essentially that's what those Arthurian legends are. They're legends. Was he a man? Probably not. He was probably a lot of important people from a thousand or two thousand years before Christianity put its roots into the earth here in the British Isles. However, let's believe that Arthur existed. Um, here in Glastonbury, uh, uh, there is a, 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 his final resting place. We're looking at it here in this video. Um, in the 1100s, there was a great fire. Uh, 1180 is a great fire here at Glastonbury. The, the, the timbers caught fire, the leaded roof melted and ran through the streets of Glastonbury. We know that. There are written records telling us that. But we have to remember that uh, these great buildings were founded because they would attract money, they would draw money, they were money-making machines. If you were a wealthy person, you would pay pilgrimage, you would come to a place like this, you would stay in the hostelries or stay here in the abbey. And you pay a lot of money to do so and be allowed to worship at some of the great, uh, 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 some, of the, some of the great relics held here in this, this, this abbey um, that would have come from all over the Middle East, come out of uh, uh, portraying various aspects of the scriptures themselves, perhaps a thorn from uh, the, the, the crown of thorns, perhaps a splinter from the, the one true cross. They would have been here in great caskets and people would pray and pay to pray at them. The Great Fire destroyed all of that. It meant that those 1,100 monks had to go home. They were out of work. The abbot, a very powerful man politically and financially, was out of work. 
the walls that existed around the abbey served a purpose. That was to keep the people out and to keep the monks in. Um, but all of that wealth had gone in that great fire. So what were they to do? The abbot was a friend of King Edward I. He sent uh, uh, messages to the king and the king said, oh dear. The abbot was a great ally of Edward I. So a story was created. The abbot said that he had a dream and he should go and dig a hole in a large grassy area where the cloisters used to be. And he may find something that will resurrect the abbey to its former, former grace. He and a couple of monks went, they dug a hole one wintry night and they found a casket, a coffin, in this hole in the ground, six feet down. They lifted it out, it was a tree trunk, essentially cut in half lengthways. As they lifted it out, it rolled over and the contents of this tree trunk, hollowed out tree trunk, fell out and it was skeletal remains of a very tall man and a shorter woman. They could, they, the story goes, they had no idea who this was, but upon closer inspection, they found a crucifix, a lead crucifix embedded uh, on the underside of the tree trunk. And it said, here essentially, here lies uh, the mortal remains of uh, Guinevere and King Arthur. Wow, hallelujah. Why was this important? This was important because monks were just about the only people in Christendom who could read. They had all read of this great superhero of the day, King Arthur. In fact, they would have read about two people, Jesus Christ and King Arthur. Those two people in the whole of Christendom. That's why this myth and legend still stands, not just here in Britain, but also in Western France. Throughout the whole of Christendom, King Arthur had laid his roots courtesy of literature, courtesy of books, and courtesy of the monks that wrote those books and said those stories, told those stories. So this man who slayed evil and did good um, can be found in, in every corner of Europe, but he's buried here because of that great fire. They needed a story. They needed relics. They found relics. Or did they? Or did they? And they took those bones out of the cloistered area and they buried them here at great ceremony. The king himself came down to lay more credence to this story and they worshipped at the gravesite of King Arthur. King went home, the story was put out, messengers went to every corner of Christendom throughout Europe and people came back to Glastonbury. Having heard about the fire, they came back to Glastonbury. Even though it's a ruin, the building is a fire shod ruin. People came back, the money started to pour in, and within 15 years, the abbey was bigger and better than it had ever been before, thanks to King Arthur. Myth or legend or fact, you be the judge. I do know that there are no bones in this grave. So as we walk around the ruins and we all walk around the, uh, the abbey grounds, I want you to understand these walls were whitewashed, they were plastered, and then they were painted, highly decorated. Um, being plastered with this lovely soft, uh, polished material, you could paint anything on it in great detail. So the uh, original builders of the abbey, they sent messengers all over Europe and they brought back pigments, they brought back colorings, things that could be used to paint at great cost. The glass was brought back from different corners of Europe at great cost. The floor tiles were painted and glazed at great cost. The roof was a magnificent um, uh, uh, leaded affair um, that was built at great cost. It was a precious material in those days as it is today. The stonework, the stonemasons were brought in at great cost. This was a most lavish building and the people who lived here were not ordinary people. They were the sons of great people. They were the second sons of great people because the first sons would inherit the title, would inherit the lands, would inherit the wealth. So the second sons would come and work and live in sumptuous luxury in a place such as this. The great wall that we saw when we walked in, that was to keep people out. There would be uh, sheriffs, constables patrolling that wall to keep people out because of the wealth and power that was here within the walls. The people outside the walls, by the way, you could use different names. Certainly the monks will have used different names to describe them. Um, they could have been called serfs. They were working the land. 
serfs, we now would say servants. Um, they, could be, uh, 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 they could be called slaves. Some of them were slaves. Not in the sense that you as Americans would understand, but they, certainly in the sense that they, they were property or chattel of the, of the abbey and therefore had to work the abbey's lands, the lands outside the walls. By the way, the people outside the walls at this point in time, from 1066 onwards, they didn't own the land outside these walls. The abbey owned the lands outside these walls. And uh, the law provided by the abbey told people outside the walls what they could and couldn't do. Minor infractions would, uh, could ensue the, uh, the removal of a nose or your ears or your hands. The church ruled. And from 1066 onwards, after the Norman Conquest, um, the church was given autonomy over much of England. They were given the power and they had to rule, certainly under the king's name, but they had to rule and uh, uh, make sure the people didn't rebel. They had to make sure the taxes came in, they make sure, had to make sure the land was tilled. Abbeys were money-making machines, both for the people that lived in them and for the people who ruled the lands after 1066. Now we're walking towards um, some great kitchens. The medieval kitchens here at um, Glastonbury are the best preserved in Europe and uh, in a moment we'll take a look inside them. Here's the, the uh, exterior of the building itself, fabulous building I have to say. It looks, it's actually a lot larger than it looks from here but so once we go inside you'll see what I mean. I would say what I'm saying because I want you to understand the power and the wealth here. This was not the church as you, as modern, uh, modern Americans and Europeans believe it to be. Um, this was a tyrannical force on the land. This was feudalism, and it was feudalism at its worst. In 1000s, 1100s, 1200s, 1300s, 1400s, and the 1500s, for 500 years, structures like this ruled the land in a very authoritative way. This was the feudal system. The people outside weren't taught anything except how to plow a furrow in the land. Um, they were not entitled to own anything. They had to farm the land for these people and they would live as chattel, they would live on the land and they would die on the land at very young ages because they had to work for these people. So I want you to understand that. these I always say this to my tour groups, feudalism um, was representative of aristocracy as well as theocracy. And here we are in a representation of theocracy. These are the kitchens. Uh, look at the number of fireplaces they have here, each one of which would have had different uh, uh, meat products or stews, breads being baked in them, massive chimneys that go up through the walls and out through the vaulted ceiling at the top. In fact, the whole roof is, is one huge chimney and each of these little chimney places go into it, uh, creating a draft essentially so that uh, the cooks and chefs inside this building wouldn't cook themselves uh, because of all of the heat. But it's a wonderful architectural uh, 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 site in its own right. So I would be taking groups here just to have a look at it, just in its own right, even if the Abbey were not here. So great power and great wealth um, is represented in these structures. And of course in the Mid-1500s, a man came along who changed all of that. I mentioned him already, a man called King, King Henry VIII. Uh, for various reasons, he decided to dissolve the abbeys and monasteries. Now, what were those reasons? Many of you think it was because he had a dispute, a spat with the Pope in Rome. Yes, he did. He wanted an annulment to one of his marriages. It wasn't granted. It wasn't granted. So he decided that uh, he was going to issue a divorce to himself. As King of England, he had the right to um, say what went on in his own lands, the same right as the Pope did. He was given his title of king by God. He was anointed with holy oil that said that, just as the Pope was. So he felt he had equal voice under the law, and the law was his in his own domain here in the British Isles. So he de decreed himself, uh, his, his marriage uh, 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 annulled, knowing that there would be the possibility of war with the Pope and all of the papal nations in Europe. That meant all of Europe. Now, Britain at that point in time was a tiny inconsequential backwater in Europe. Small number of people, perhaps three and a half million people in total. 
France alone had 16 mil million people at that point in time. He was putting himself up against with the great powers of Europe, knowing that he probably wouldn't survive to tell about it, but he had to do something to defend his lands. What was that something? We're now looking into a recent excavation that took place here at the Lady Chapel. Um, beautiful structure, as I say, this is the more recent renovation that takes back to the 13, 14, 1500s here at the Abbey. So Henry VIII, what did he do? Well, by di dissolving the abbeys and monasteries, um, the monastic settlements in Britain, he was carving out a large portion of the religious landscape here in Britain, a portion that was allied to the Pope. These people, the people that, and the wealth and the power living and accommodated in structures such as Glastonbury Abbey were a sword to his back. If there had been war, he was worried about the power that these people wielded behind him, that sword at his back. So by dissolving them, that sword at his back was removed. He could also then dissolve the wealth and use that wealth, and he did. It didn't go into his back pocket. He wasn't a corrupt man in that sense. This money was spent defending his realm he created a mobile army that uh, literally protected the south, southern and eastern shores of England. He created the first Royal Navy. He put bastions and fortifications all the way around the southern coast and southeastern coast of England to protect from that what he thought was an imminent invasion that never came. Um, but uh, in so dissolving the monasteries and abbeys, he destroyed um, the theocracy in this country. And he took us into a period of learning. Um, he combined, the, being a Welshman himself or by birth, um, he combined the laws of Wales to the laws of England and combined them, um, making very powerful common laws for the people, which have been a springboard ever since. I mean, you in, in America, in Canada, throughout the English-speaking world and other corners of the globe, they still now practice English law, English common law. They wouldn't call it English law, but they practice common law, which is English law, courtesy of this man, Henry VIII and his dis, uh, dissolution of the monasteries and abbeys. So much as we look upon the damage done to buildings such as this and the stripping away of the wealth, was that a bad thing? This is the question I pose people, was that a bad thing? It's a question I'll ask you, think on it. Look at this gorgeous building. When he dissolved the abbeys and monasteries, uh, the roof, roofing material was taken away and the building was stripped and plundered. And what we have left, ever since the mid to late six, uh, 1500s, we have 800 buildings like this across the face of Britain that are ruins, thanks to Henry VIII. Was that a bad thing? I don't know. I don't know. I'll leave that for you to be judge on. Um, all of these abbeys, monasteries, they will have had gardens, gardens certainly for, to grow vegetables and food, but also gardens to grow uh, medicinal uh, compounds, um, veg uh, essentially plants that could be useful in medicine. Something else you would pay the church to do is to have access to their, their apothecaries, and these gardens would provide that man with uh, useful materials, shall we say. Quick stroll through this. This is just a little, re little representation of what it, what it will have been. You can see the fruit trees in the distance. Somerset, known for its cider, I may say. Cider in uh, southwestern England is, is alcoholic. The word cider just means alcoholic apple juice. I know in America you also have this word hard cider. Um, well, cider is, 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 is hard. It is alcoholic, so we don't need the hard bit um, over here. Uh, but uh, Somerset was uh, uh, famous and still is famous for uh, its orchards. Uh, but that also is courtesy of the Normans. When the Normans came in 1066, they brought with them the ability to turn apple growing in, uh, into an industrial process, essentially. So all of these great abbeys that were handed over to the, the Norman uh, abbots, they, they then started to grow great orchards because it was also a cash cow for the, the abbeys, for the monasteries, for the churches themselves. So wherever you see an abbey, you are probably going to find, uh, large extent, orchards. And therefore, also bees and beehives, because with orchards you need the apples to be pollinated, the, bee, the pears to be pollinated, so honey is also a byproduct of areas such as this. So cider and honey you will find still to this day, a thousand years later, here in Somerset. Here I am standing now in the crypts of the, uh, 
the Lady Chapel were looking up. As I say, this area was excavated just recently. Um, they just wanted to see who was down here, whose bones were buried here. We're still waiting for all of those results to come in. They, they are slowly leaking information out to us. They found a number of bishops. A number of abbots, even one or two saints. Saint Ankelm was one, a Celtic saint. Yes, there were Celtic saints, not ordained by the Catholic Church in any way, shape or form. Just important people before organized religion came to town. If you've seen some of my uh, uh, videos on Brittany, you'll see that I touched upon that subject already. Beautifully ornate stonework. Again, these walls will have been plastered, stained glass windows. There will have been a leaded roof over a, a wooden and perhaps even slated roof. Um, tile floor would have been above our head. And down here is where the remains of those priests were buried, the crypts. I hope you've enjoyed this. Um, you can see the little sign that just flashed up. Please contribute to the making of this video if you wish. Um, Wells Cathedral and the great city of Wells will be the next video. I look forward to seeing you soon.